Order. Stephen Connect to move the motion. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, Chairman. Yeah. It's a yeah. pleasure to serve under your, under your chairmanship. Um, before beginning this debate in earnest, I just wanted to make uh, a couple of things clear, which will, I hope, ensure that this and subsequent debates can proceed in a constructive manner. First, nothing that I, and that I hope others will say today, is about religion or ethnicity. This is not an issue of Arab, Muslim, or Jewish people. It's about upholding our basic values of justice and human rights. It's about holding to account those states, governments, and duty bearers that violate these principles and laws. And while this debate will, of course, discuss Israeli government policies with regard to the demolitions, this isn't about being pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. It's about being pro-justice and pro-human rights. At a time when there seems to be a growing number of countries <coughs> facing conflict, upheaval, and political uncertainty, it is not a question of which is more important to talk about. They all are. In the case of Palestine, it has been in a perpetual, or some would say declining, state of all of the above for over 50 years. Indeed, it is one of the most protracted conflicts in the world. And s I will give way. To my honourable friend for giving way and congratulating him on securing this debate. On that issue of decline, does he agree with me that over the last three years since the, that particular aspect of the conflict ended, conditions are actually getting worse in the Gaza Strip and many constituents have contacted me about that declining humanitarian situation. We need to redouble our efforts internationally to tackle it. I thank my honourable friend for that intervention. I would agree and, and would point out that a recent UN report declared that Gaza will be unlivable by uh, 2020 due, due to the degrading infra infrastructure there for reasons that we know well. Uh, and so I, I, I think my honourable friend is, is absolutely right on that point. I will give way. And I, I thank my honourable friend for giving way. He, he is very generous. In relation to his um, comments just, just made, would he accept that Hamas rebuilding the terrorist tunnels only very recently can only make the prospects of peace recede even more very regrettably? I thank my honourable friend. I, I would agree that faults uh, are, um, can be allocated on all sides of this conflict. The point I would like to make, and I, I hope I'll be able to um, illustrate this further in my speech, is that uh, I, I, I feel that Israel holds the whip hand in this situation. They, it is in their gift to make some progress and move forward, and, and I, I do think it's important to see the balance of the relationship in that context. Uh, I will give way to, to my honourable friend. Given that there's been encroachment on Palestinian lands through demolition and sanctions on the Palestinians, does he think <coughs> that it's leading to a situation where two-state solution may not be viable anymore? I, I, I thank my honourable friend. I personally remain absolutely committed to the two-state solution, but I, I do recognise, as I'll be, be setting out in the speech, with a 600% increase in settlements uh, in the illegally occupied territories of the West Bank, it, it does become increasingly difficult to see how a two-state solution could work with that level uh, of occupation taking place. Um, it, well, on that point, if... Uh, well, I'm extremely grateful him, uh, uh, for giving me and for securing this debate and for the very considered comments he's made right at the beginning of his uh, contribution. And does it not underline the importance that those people who are in, in, in a position of influence take that measured response and therefore the comments... Uh, from the President of the United States later this, uh, uh, this afternoon in which he will recognise Jerusalem as the capital of Israel is highly regrettable uh, and highly dangerous. Uh, well, uh, my, uh, the Honourable Gentleman may, may well have seen a draft of my speech because I was uh, about to come on to that very point. The expected announcement by the President of the United States later today to recognise Jerusalem as the capital of Israel has sent shockwaves across the world. And if this happens, it may well be the death knell for any prospective peace process. But I'll talk a bit more about the changing facts on the ground and what this means for peace in a while. Uh, the second point I wanted to make in terms of the framing for this debate is I want to be as clear as possible. I am deeply ashamed of the fact that due to the actions, views and behaviour of a minority of persons in my party, that a perception has grown that Labour has a problem with anti-Semitism. I have no truck no truck whatsoever 
with anyone who expresses or excuses anti-Semitic views. And any member of the Labour Party, and any member of the Labour Party, or any party for that matter who does, should be expelled as fast as possible. And that applies whoever you are. Be you the former mayor of one of the great cities of the world, someone who has just delivered some leaflets, or an otherwise inactive member, if you are an anti-Semite, or a defender or excuser of anti-Semites, then you are not welcome in our party. You never have been, and you never will be. Uh, my, my honourable friend, um, he, he is again very generous. In, in relation to his comment, um, how does he view the statements of indeed members of the Labour Party who claim that allegations of anti-Semitism are simply smears against the leader of the Labour Party? Uh, uh, I thank my honourable friend, uh, and I, I think what we need to remain absolutely clear on here is that anything which looks to defend or excuse or indeed promote anything which could be remotely perceived as anti-Semitism must be uh, treated with, uh, as grounds for expulsion from the party. And I think we need to hold very true to that principle. Uh, very briefly. Dr. Philip Bewitt. It's really just on that point. I mean, I think it has to be recognised that the people of Israel would gain from a solution and peace and being able to not have to expend so much energy and the energy of their young people on security and be able to move forward. This is not just about a solution for the people of Palestine. It's about a solution for the people of Israel. Uh, I, I thank the Honourable Lady. It's absolutely right. There can be no peace without security, and there can be no security without peace. And that is a rule that applies universally. With that in mind, I hope that today we can have a constructive debate, finding common ground and advancing the cause of peace, justice and security for the peoples of both Israel and Palestine. Next year will mark 25 years since the signing of the Oslo Accords, a moment that was meant to represent a turning point, heralding a new and lasting era of peace and coexistence, the beginning of a genuine and complete two-state solution. But what has a Palestinian approaching his or her 25th birthday today actually seen? An increase in the number of illegal settlers from 258,000 to over 600,000, despite countless international rulings that settlements violate international law. The Oslo generation has seen nothing but increasing fragmentation and annexation of their land. Would that be Frank of Wales? I, will. Um, I, I was very struck by what you were saying about the situation of children and young people, which is something I saw for myself when I visited the West Bank. According to the Norwegian Refugee Council, there are 55 educational facilities in Area C of the West Bank with outstanding demolition orders against them. Would he join me in sending a strong message to the Israeli government today that demolishing schools is completely unacceptable and counter to any effort to achieve peace in the region? I thank my honourable friend, and the, the point I would add to that is we, we of course, for uh, many years in the international community have been uh, telling the people of Palestine that with politics and constructive engagement, a solution will be found. And what hope are we giving to those young people in those educational establishments if uh, that seems to not be happening? If I could just Hold make on. a little more progress, and I will give way to my honourable friend. 50,000 homes and properties demolished, often resulting in the forced displacement of families and entire communities. The construction of an illegal separation barrier carving up the West Bank, brutally disconnecting towns, cities, families and communities from each other. For the first time in history, the separation of the historic cities of Jerusalem and Bethlehem. And Jerusalem, well, the si friend, I, I, I will give way. I, I thank my honourable friend for giving way. I wanted to uh, address my comments to the specific issue of Jerusalem and the very unfortunate and misguided announcement from the US President. I wonder if my honourable friend would like to comment on the restatement of British policy at Prime Minister's questions today, that Jerusalem should not be uh, dealt with in the way the US President has suggested. I thank my honourable friend. I very much welcome the comments of the Prime Minister at Prime Minister's questions. I think it was a very important restatement of some uh, very uh, important principles. Let us just hope that she may be able to have some form of uh, constructive conversation with the President of the United States about that, although having a constructive conversation with that particular gentleman seems to be a difficult thing to do. Um, and Jerusalem, the city of three faiths, is under constant threat as a political pawn. The separation of the West Bank and Gaza with a two million population trapped in the tiny Gaza Strip in what some have called the world's largest open-air prison 
thanks to the land, sea and air blockage of Gaza. A third of the two million people crammed into Gaza's 139 square miles are under 15 and almost half are under 25. A 10-year-old child will have already lived through three major wars. This is no way to grow up. In short, any young person born at the time of the Oslo Accords has only seen diminishing rights and freedoms, less security and a fragmented territory that pushes the possibility of a two-state solution even further away. And for giving way, and I draw attention to my entry in the Member's Register of Interests. I visited Sisia with Kabu on a delegation in 2015 and heard firsthand how people living there were terrified of the threat of demolition. Does my honourable friend agree that we need to redouble and intensify our efforts to stop these demolitions? I thank my honourable friend. I've also uh, visited uh, Sisia, and, uh, and uh, it, it is uh, a moving experience. Uh, and particularly uh, when you see what needs to be done uh, in order to avoid the uh, risk of creating a construction which could be considered as something that's... And so buildings built with tyres, for example, in order to avoid that uh, position. Paul Blomfield, I thank my honourable friend for giving way and for the way that he framed the debate. Um, just over three weeks ago, I was in the Bedouin village of uh, Karna Lamar uh, and took time out to see the school there. That school, built with the support of the international community uh, and the village, is facing demolition, apparently to make way for further illegal settlements, and apparently the Israelis are <coughs> upping the preparations for that demolition to happen within the next few weeks. Would my honourable friend agree with me that the minister, in his response, and I understand that he's, he's also visited uh, the, the village, <laughs> should commit to redoubling the government's efforts to stop that demolition happening. I thank my honourable friend, and uh, I, in my speech I'll, I'll talk a little more about the other um, communities that are under threat of demolition. I very much look forward to hearing the Minister's response and really do hope that it won't just be rhetoric, but there'll be some reality in there as well. I, I will give way, and then I'll make some progress. To Ian Lucas. Lucas. I'm, great, I'm grateful to my uh, honourable friend. One of the strengths of Israel is the independence of its rule of law and the way that the courts fearlessly uh, impose decisions on occasions. But what is particularly tragic about the, uh, the, the schools that are being th threatened with demolition, and I've seen them myself, as many other people have to today, is that they are in the shadow of illegal settlements. And the contradiction and imbalance that exists there does not help Israel and the perception of Israel in the rest of the world. I thank my honourable friend, and, and the, the juxtaposition of those young people in those communities seeking to get an education with uh, right on their doorstep those illegal settlements, I think is a, it's a metaphor for the, the terribly challenging situation uh, in which we find ourselves. Um, I will give way and then I'll make some progress. I was talking about, Hamas, about, uh, about Gaza. Isn't it actually the case that Israel signed an agreement on movement and access on Gaza with the Palestinian Authority Okay, the Palestinians' control over the borders for the first time in history allowed imports and exports, planned for the construction of a seaport and an airport. But what happened? And it pulled out of Gaza, it removed the settlers. But Hamas took over, uh, expelled Fatah, murdered rival Palestinians, uh, armed itself with hundreds of thousands of rockets aimed at Israel, provided by Iran, dug tunnels to attack, to attack civilians on, uh, on, on kibbutzes. That's what happened in Gaza. What responsibility does he ascribe to Hamas for the situation in Gaza, and how does he think it's possible to resolve this? Yeah, we're gonna... what, I, what I would say to my honourable friend is that uh, I, I agree that many of the things that he uh, listed there have taken place, but the fact remains that there has been a land, sea and air-based blockade uh, of the Gaza Strip uh, throughout that entire period and we are now in a situation where Gaza is described as the largest open air prison in the world uh, and where it, the UN has declared it will be unlivable by 2020. So there's a humanitarian crisis there that, that has to be resolved and it, it is in the gift of the Israeli government to take that forward. I'll make a little bit of progress if you don't mind. I'll, I'll just make a little bit more progress and then I'll give away. Um, in short, any... Um, I'm sorry. Uh, so this is the harsh reality of the facts on the ground. I met with the Commissioner General of UNRWA yesterday and his message to the international community was clear. Conflict management is not enough. We must do more to support an actual resolution to this conflict. 
I agree we cannot continue with a wait-and-see approach. Where has that got us over the last 50 years, 25 years, or the 10 years of Gaza blockade? And, where, and we are where we are because of choices that have been made, choices on both sides of this conflict. Foremost amongst those choices has been the active choice to continue the expansion of illegal settlements on Palestinian territory and the forcible transfer of Palestinian families and communities from their homes. Both of these policies have created a coercive environment that seeks to undermine the ability of Palestinians to continue living where they are, therefore at great risk of forcible transfer, which is in clear violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Mr Chairman, just over a month ago, a UN report found that Israel's role as a, an occupying power in the Palestinian territories has, and I quote, crossed a red line into illegality. International law is clear. An occupying power cannot treat occupied territory as its own, nor make claims of sovereignty. Occupation must be temporary, the power must act in good faith and in the best interests of the protected or occupied population. Yet, and these are the findings of the UN and its special rapporteur, that has been the repeated pattern of behaviour of successive Israeli governments over the 50 years of the occupation. And a central plank of the occupation and spread of settlements has been the demolitions. It is estimated that al almost 50,000 Palestinian structures have been demolished since 1967, with 1,500 homes demolished in Rafah alone between 2000 and 2004. This in spite of warnings from Theodore Meron, later the president of the International <coughs> Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in 1968, that the demolitions, even on security grounds, broke international law and the Fourth Geneva Convention. Article 53 of that convention prohibits the destruction of private property by an occupying power, and it is unequivocal. <coughs> so how does the Israeli government respond? Not by denying the substance of the claims of demolition, but by claiming that Palestine is not a party to the Geneva Convention because it is not a state. Astonishing. Stepping beyond the fact that the policies of the Israeli government are the main obstacle to Palestinian statehood, that is an utterly specious argument because a basic and fun fundamental principle of human rights law is that international human rights treaties apply in all areas in which a state exercises effective control. And the occupation clearly constitutes such control. I will give way. I'm grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. He mentioned the UN report and uh, international structures. I just wondered if he's aware of the EU report from March of this year, which condemns the uh, six months of, uh, well, over six months, 311,692 um, euros worth of EU aid structures have also been demolished. Um, and I think last year it was 182 structures. These are meant to be for humanitarian projects. And I know that the EU is, uh, has condemned uh, these destructions of its structures, and there are eight countries that are putting together uh, an approach to recover the monies for these. It's seen as a very blunt, blunt diplomatic move, but desperate times possibly call for desperate measures. I, I thank, thank my honourable friend, and, and we've talked about uh, all sides um, losing out from what's happening on the ground. And clearly Israel is not doing itself any favours with the international community when it's destroying structures that have been built with European Union aid money. Um, clearly, Palestine is treated as an exception to these laws. There are currently 46 Bedouin communities at risk of forcible transfer in Area C of the West Bank. For the implementation of pa Israel's controversial and outright illegal E1 plan, which, in, which would allow Israel to connect its mega settlements from north to south, effectively splitting the West Bank in two and cutting off Jerusalem from any further Palestinian state. I visited one of the communities during my last visit to the region with Kabu. The residents of Khan al-Ahmar told us how they lived under constant fear and threat of forcible transfer, not knowing when the bulldozers might arise, arrive and raise their homes to the, and schools to the ground. There is a huge campaign underway in the occupied territories right now to protect the school, the only one for miles from demolition. While we were there, we were told how the children's swings in the playground were uprooted because they violated Israeli planning laws. There are, according to reports, at present over 50 schools in the West Bank with demolition or stop work orders. In August, on the eve, I will in, in, in August, on the eve of the new school year, the Israeli authorities requisitioned nine educational-related structures in Area C and demolished 
a newly established kindergarten in the Bedouin community of Jabal Ababa. Lillian Greenwood. Honourable friend for giving way, and he's making a very powerful case about the importance of maintaining international humanitarian uh, law. But does he share my concerns that if these demolitions are to go ahead uh, in the weeks uh, ahead, as we fear it will be in the middle of winter, and potentially the putting families, and particularly young children, uh, at great risk as they could be without not just their schools uh, and their playgrounds but their homes uh, at a time when they'll face incredible hardship and, uh, and real destitution. I thank you, Manuel, and, and she's absolutely right. Clearly we're in uh, the midst of a, a potentially uh, a humanitarian crisis which may seem uh, small scale in pure num numerical terms for how many children use that school but for those children and for their lives it's potentially catastrophic and I think the, the, we should appeal to the humanitarian instincts of all honourable members today. It, I, I, I will give way. I'm grateful. Uh, my friends make a very powerful case about the day-to-day -day disruption of the lives of ordinary Palestinians. Would you agree with a central point of this? None of this can be justified by reference to Hamas. None of it can be justified by general reference to the security situation. Everybody in this, this uh, de debating chamber must agree <coughs> that security is, is fundamental for Israel, but it shouldn't erode the day-to-day -day rights of Palestinian men, women and children. I thank my honourable friend. What we know is there can be no peace without security and there can be no security without peace. So we have to find a way out of this uh, vicious circle. And I do believe that it's, uh, it's in the gift of the Israeli government to make the progress that's so desperately required. So it seems that nothing is off limits. During August and September 2017, the Israeli authorities demolished or seized a total of 63 Palestinian-owned structures, affecting over 1,200 people all on grounds of lack of Israeli-issued permits, which are nearly impossible to obtain. The Supreme Court of Israel, the role of which is to protect the rule of law, has, in a peak of irony, ruled that demolitions can be carried out with any right to appeal if the IDF judges that advanced warning would hinder demolition action. According, accordingly, the Israeli NGO Batsalem it says, it seems that Israel is so confident in its ability to expel entire villages without incurring judicial or international criticism that it is no longer bothering to create even the illusion of legal proceedings. Israel is often portrayed as a lonely beacon of democracy and pluralism in the Middle East. Well, it's time the Israeli government began to live up to that because there is nothing democratic or pluralistic about demolishing homes, community infrastructures or schools and kindergartens. And there is certainly nothing democratic or pluralistic about denying due process and undermining the rule of law. I'm very grateful for the Honourable Member for giving way, and I have to apologise for being late. I had a, a meeting with the Bahrainian Ambassador. But I was rather uh, bemused by this debate, because I know that the Honourable Member um, regularly speaks at the Centre for Turkish Studies, but I've never heard him once speak about Turkish settlers from the mainland in North Cyprus. 200,000 people who invaded North Cyprus. But the Honourable Member wants to talk about Israel. But shouldn't he, and indeed some of his friends at the Turkish Centre for order, Turkish Studies, order, actually order, consider that? Order, uh, order, order. This debate has been clearly advertised, and it is talking about a particular subject which the Honourable Member has chosen to submit to Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker has seen, seen right and fit that it should be selected for debate, and we're going to have a debate on this subject yeah. and this subject alone. Stephen Kinnock. I think the Honourable Gentleman would be delighted to discuss that uh, perhaps at another time then, uh, following the yeah. ruling of our, our Chair. It is impossible to separate the demolitions from the illegal policy of annexation and settlements, because for settlements to be constructed, existing property or land, land has to be cleared. Because of these two interconnected policies, Israel is in violation of 40 UN Security Council resolutions and over 100 General Assembly resolutions. These violations not only harm the Palestinian people and the standing of Israel, but they harm us all by serving to undermine international law and prospects for peace. They are a scar on the conscience of the international community. And the latest US move to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel supports this undermining of international law and validating the illegal policies and practices of the government of Israel. Uh, I thank the honorable gentleman uh, and he makes a very informed uh, case. Uh, he's absolutely right that the uh, illegal settlements and the demolition uh, of Palestinian property is a major roadblock to peace in that region. And as we've heard from honourable members, the announcement by 
President Trump will have a devastating impact on the region and the process. Does he agree with me that we need a united response from the international com community to condemn this move? I, I thank my honourable friend. I certainly welcomed the Prime Minister's comments earlier on and I do hope that, that there can be cross-party support for restating the very clearly uh, held and long-held position of the British Government on this matter. As we're having this debate today, a swathe of communities remain at risk of forcible transfer. Susia, Khan al-Akhmar, Ain al Hway, Omar al-Jamal and Jabal al-Baba are under imminent threat. 824 people, 464 of them under the age of 18, reside in these communities. Just a few days ago, 35 UK rabbis wrote to the Israeli ambassador regarding the impending demolitions in Susia to urge the government of Israel to stop and think. Demolition, displacement and forced transfer in Susia and other Palestinian communities in Area C would constitute a war crime under international law. Mr. Chair, I am sure that all honourable members present here today will wish to join with me in urging the Israeli government to think again and to withdraw its threat to demolish and displace these communities. These are violations of international law that set back the cause of peace and security. And I believe that we must respond to these illegal acts of occupation as we would have done to other such acts around the world. The UK and European Council prohibited the trade import of all goods from Crimea after the Russian illegal occupation and annexation back in 2014. And I believe that we should follow this precedent when it comes to the illegal settlements. This is land that's been illegally seized and annexed. Palestinian homes and property have been destroyed and seized. Communities have been uprooted, displaced and destroyed. And so, so I see no way in which we cannot cease to trade with the illegal settlements. I do not categorically not propose an end to trade with the State of Israel, of course. But let's be clear, these illegal settlements are not part of Israel proper. They are part of occupied Palestinian territory. And so how can we continue to support <laughs> this illegal settlement enterprise? Surely that, that makes us complicit in illegal activities. Continued trade with illegal settlements creates an economic incentive for more illegal acts. It encourages the demolition of homes and communities to make way for settlements, simultaneously denying Palestinians access to economic op opportunities. So it is in this coercive environment that is so insidious and dangerous. As Tamir Pardo, the former head of Mossad, has said, Israel faces one existential threat, and it is not external, Iran or Hezbollah, but rather internal. It's the result of a divisiveness in Israel resulting from a government that has, and I quote, decided to bury its head deep in the sand to preoccupy ourselves with alternative facts and free, flee from reality. These are the words of a former head of Mossad who makes clear that the existential threat facing Israel of one is one of its own making, namely the occupation. And as Pardo has gone on to argue, the blockade, the occupation, the demolitions and aggressive annexation of Palestinian land are matters that we should all be concerned about, not because it's a pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian position, but because they undermine peace as well as the moral, political and legal fabric of Israel. Unless... I will give way. How can you say, how can you argue that the existential threat Israel faces is one of its own making, when on day one, the day of Israel's establishment in 1948, the country was invaded by five Arab armies, when the PLO and Hamas have been dedicated to Israel's destruction during the entire period of the last 70 years, when Iran is committed to, it, to wiping Israel off the map of the earth and is arming Hezbollah and Hamas with rockets to do that, how can he argue that the existential threat faced by Israel is one of Israel's own making? I thank my honourable friend for that question. I, I would remind him that I'm actually quoting Tamir Pardo, the former head of Mossad, who, who has named this as the, the existential threat. But uh, I'd also worth... Uh, well, I, I, I agree with Mr. Pardo. I think that I, I think that he's. Can I? I will give me. Afzal Khan. Thank you. Uh, can I first of all congratulate the member for securing this debate, and also thank him for making such a powerful points in this whole debate. You know, if you are a Palestinian in 20, December 2017, and if you reflect back uh, 100 years of Balfour Declaration, and you find only half the deal has been done, it's the Palestinians who got nothing. If you then look at millions of refugees, the longest period that they've been refugees all over the world, 
And then if you look at the systematic taking of the land, where both in the settlement, uh, which is illegal settlements, then you've got this demolition, which is happening as well, and then you've got this uh, planning restriction where the Palestinians <coughs> can't actually get there. On top of that, you get Donald Trump, uh, who's then declaring illegally this uh, Jerusalem as being the capital. It must seem pretty awful for our Palestinians and pretty dark. What hope do they really have uh, with this? Uh, I, I thank my honourable friend, and I, I do agree that the situation looks quite bleak. I think the, the question is how can we ensure that the next generations of young Israelis and Palestinians see any merit in supporting the rule of law and democracy or believe in peace with the other side? The wall, the demolitions, the continuing land grab, the forced displacement, the isolation of Gaza. Both sides seem to be further away from peace and security than ever before. Mr. Chairman, in my opening remarks, I mentioned that this year is the 25th anniversary of Oslo. But there is another anniversary that we must recall, which is that 2017 marks the centenary of the Balfour Declaration. 100 years on from Balfour, I would urge every honourable member of this House to recall the particular responsibility that our country bears for what has come to pass. And with this in mind, I would implore us all to re revisit the historic significance of these words in which acclaim that the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Mr. I will be. Uh, would, in Can't light we? of that quote, would my honourable friend not agree that uh, the comments of the economy minister, Napoli Bennett, a few months ago, uh, said we return to the West Bank in order to stay forever without conceding land and without foreign sovereignty. And that is at somewhat variance with the statement you've just read, that the Honourable Friend has just read out uh, in connection with the, uh, from the Balfour Declaration. I thank my Honourable Friend, and, and I think the number of statements from uh, senior Israeli government officials are not helping and are not uh, making a constructive contribution to the, the peace and security that we want to see both for Israel and Palestine. Mr. Chair, my contention is twofold. First, the Israeli government is not only failing to uphold the principles and stated aims of the Balfour Declaration, it is actively undermining them on an almost daily basis. And second, that our government is utterly failing to live up to the responsibilities bequeathed upon it by Balfour. Therefore, we must, working in partnership with our international allies, deploy every diplomatic and commercial tool at our disposal to put pressure on the Israeli government. Mr. Chair, it is 100 years since Balfour. 50 years since the beginning of the illegal occupation and 25 years since Oslo. There have been moments along the way when it looked like things might change, when it seemed that negotiations might forge a path to peace. Tragically, those moments proved to be false dawns. But rather than be disheartened, we should learn from those experiences and mistakes, as opposed to continue to do the same thing, expecting different results. Just recently, Tony Blair admitted that our policy in isolation and disengagement with Hamas in Gaza was wrong. We should embrace this view and be actively looking for ways to support the present reconciliation efforts between Fatah and Hamas. Another lesson to learn, condemnation alone is not enough. What has decades of condemning illegal settlement expansion led to? A mushrooming of settlements across the Palestinian territory and 600,000 illegal settlers. We have to disincentivize the settlement enterprise and put a cost on the violation of international law. We know that we in this House can no longer stand by and do nothing. We, as international actors, have a duty to act. And part of that duty is holding duty bearers to account, whether it's the PA, Hamas, or Israel as the occupying power. Generations of Palestinians have grown up with diminishing rights and freedoms. So how can we expect them to have faith in conventional politics believe in the rule of law, and continue to hope for peace. Let's not forget that beyond the statistics and legal arguments, these are ordinary communities and families who have the same basic aspirations we do, to live in safety and security, to protect their families and loved ones, to enjoy their basic rights, whether it's in education or economic, and oppor or economic opportunity. But we will also see the continued pollution of the Israeli body politic by divisive figures and ideas with no interest in peace unless we speak up for and assert norms of internal and international decency and justice, then injustice on both sides of this conflict will escalate 
and spiral out of control. So let us stand up and speak up today, and let us make our voice heard. Thank you. The question is that this House has considered the effect of Israeli demolitions on Palestinian communities. Now, if you could...